Section 1. You will hear a conversation between a woman making inquiries and a school receptionist. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. You will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion, only the conversation relating to this will be played first. Good afternoon, Estelle speaking. What can I do for you? I was told that the school holds, um, adult education classes? Yes, it does. We run seven a week, three on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and one on Wednesdays. The receptionist, Estelle, says the school holds seven classes a week, so seven has been written in the space. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Good afternoon, Estelle speaking. What can I do for you? I was told that the school holds, um, adult education classes? Yes, it does. We run seven a week, three on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and one on Wednesdays. Are they all evening classes? No. Because of the number of people who work shifts these days, we found there's quite a demand for day classes as well. Well, I don't work, and I really want to get out and meet people, so daytime or evening would suit me. What is it you're particularly interested in? Oh, anything really. Okay. On Tuesdays we have a writing workshop for those people who've always longed to write but are hesitant about putting pen to paper. Hmm... It's an evening class and runs from 6 to 7.30, but there is a restriction on numbers. Oh! Yes. The tutor has advised us to restrict participants to a maximum of 10 per session, so I'll have to check and let you know if there is room for you. Thank you. Also, on Tuesdays, there is a book club designed for older adults looking to be inspired, to learn and share insights with one another. Are there any restrictions on that? Not really, but you'd have to be able to read the prescribed book each week. Hmm. You have to read set books, do you? Yes, and keep up with the others by finishing one a week. I understand. What else do you have? There's a history group on Tuesdays as well, run by a researcher and historian who provides a fascinating glimpse for you into the lives and society around this area a hundred years ago. Hmm, I don't think so. Well, what about Scrabble Club on Wednesday? It's extremely popular, you know. Sounds good. What time? 2 to 3.30 in the afternoon. Yes, I think I could manage that. Well, if you like Scrabble, you might like to join the Chess Night on Thursday evenings. It's more for serious players, though. Unfortunately, I don't play chess. Would you be interested in cake decorating? Well, I do enjoy baking from time to time. Have you thought about decorated cakes, though? You know, they make a wonderful focal point of any special celebration. Maybe not. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Look, I don't know if you'd be interested, but next month there's going to be an Adult Learners Week, and it's a great opportunity to learn something new and meet a lot of people. All the events are free, but booking is essential. What are the events? I'll give you a brief rundown, and if you decide there's something in it for you, I can send you all the details. 
Great. When is it? The first week in September, from the first to the eighth. Oh, are they all daytime events? Yes, but some are half day and some are whole day sessions. Can you just quickly tell me about the half day ones, please? Okay. The Techno Expo will help you work with social networking tools, and you can learn more about online privacy and security and online entertainment. That's Monday the first. In the morning? Actually, it's after lunch, from one to four thirty. What else is there in the afternoon? Well, on Wednesday, there's work-life balance, understanding how to assess what you really value, the importance of balance and harmony in your life, and how to achieve it. That's another one I'd like to go to. Are there any more? No, no more half days in the afternoon. Wait a minute. There is a poetry event. What does that entail? Writing some inspirational poems and sharing them with the class. No, thank you. I'm not going to read my poems to other people. I know what you mean. One more thing. Can you tell me where all the events are being held? Yes, all the workshops are at the central library. Oh, good. That's handy. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. You are going to hear a lecture about the Miner's Hotel. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fourteen. Now listen to the tape and answer questions eleven to fourteen. Good evening and welcome to the Minor Hotel. We are pleased to have you as our guest. I will give you a brief information session to tell you everything you need to know to make this a pleasant stay. The Minor Hotel was built in the eighteen fifties during the Gold Rush period, also nicknaming our state the Golden State. People from all over the country and even from other countries came to seek their fortune here in these hills, creating cities overnight. In this city, many gold rush hotels soon opened up. This particular hotel was built in 1851, but was destroyed during an earthquake. It was rebuilt in 1995 to recreate the feel of the gold rush, complete with articles and actual photographs from during the 1850s. Our hotel is divided into two buildings, one called the Gold Tower, and the other is named the Fortune Tower. You will be staying in the Fortune Tower on the twenty-fifth floor, complete with great views of the city. Your room is the best room in the hotel, complete with private living room and hot tub. Here is your room card. On the card, it will say F T, meaning Fortune Tower. On the bottom of the card, it will say twenty-five fifteen. The twenty-five stands for the twenty-fifth floor, and the fifteen stands for the fifteen room on that particular floor. Now look at questions fifteen to twenty. Now listen to the tape and answer questions fifteen to twenty. There are emergency exits in both towers of the hotel. They are located on the south side, opposite the elevators. Please use these in case of a fire or other emergency. We have some special events happening this week. Our Miners Diner is offering a special Miners Buffet dinner this Friday and Saturday for only twenty dollars per person. This special includes all food, not including drinks and alcohol, and shows for the night. The buffet will be available from five to midnight. Because of the historical significance of our hotel, there are some special rules. 
The first rule is that there is no smoking allowed anywhere in the building, not even in your own room. This is not only to ensure the safety and health of our guests, but also the furniture and pictures can be easily damaged by smoke and other harsh treatment. Please remember that there are items of furniture over a hundred years old here, so respect the rules by not smoking. Secondly, please do not take pictures using a flash of any of the drawings and paintings in the rooms or hallways as they are old and fragile. We are doing our best to preserve a national treasure, so please help us in doing so. Lastly, you will only have one set of towels and bed sheets per three days. This is to conserve the water supply, as there are frequent droughts this high up in the hills. If there are any further questions, the staff of the hotel will be available to answer your questions. In the event that no one is able to answer your questions, I will also be available from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. each day in the concierge. I hope you enjoy your stay here with us. Thank you very much. This is the end of Section 2. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers. Section 3. You are going to hear a conversation between Sally and Ben. They are new college students. You now have some time to read questions 21 to 25. Now, listen to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 21 to 25. Hi, Ben. Sally. How are you? Fine. I wondered if I'd run into you. When did you get here? I only arrived last night, just in time. I prefer to travel on Sundays to miss the working rush. I suppose you arrived in plenty of time. Oh, I've been here for four days now. So it must have been Thursday that I arrived. I like to have a good chance to look around and settle in. I should have come earlier too. I'm hoping to get a part-time job. Well, you've no time today, I suppose. Do you still plan to be an architect? Yes. It's what I've always wanted to do. And you were planning to do economics, weren't you? Yes, I was. But now I've decided on psychology instead. How many textbooks do you have to get? I've been given this long list, and I'm sure they'll cost a fortune. See? That looks a lot. It's longer than my list. Well, it's 14, all told. So I might use library copies instead of buying some of them. What about you? I'll probably buy the whole lot of mine because I only have five on my list. Although I'm sure there are many more I'll have to read. Luckily, we don't have to read them all straight away. Have you got your class timetable yet? It came with the book list. When do your lectures start? Tuesday. That's tomorrow. How about yours? Oh, I've got an extra day. The day after yours start. Now you have some time to read questions 26 to 30. As the conversation continues, they are talking about their new college life. Listen carefully and answer questions 26 to 30. It's nothing like school, is it? Not so far, and the lectures will certainly be different. Do you have any special approach for keeping up with lectures and the amount we have to read? Well, I usually try to read every word in a book in case I miss something important. So I suppose I'll try to write down every word of the lecture if I can. Oh, I couldn't do that. I'd get cramp in my fingers and I wouldn't really hear what was being said. I usually skim a book when I read 
and underline key parts, so I guess I'll try to make notes on the main points of the lecture. Have you thought of using a cassette recorder? You mean to record the lecture? Yep. Then you could make really good notes. Is it allowed? I think so. It must be. Plenty of people seem to do it. It has to be better than trying to write every word as you listen. Anyway, what's your first lecture about? Oh, it's on the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution? Sounds boring to me. Not really. It made a big difference to everything, including architecture eventually. So, what's your first lecture about? It's about what separates humans from other animals. Okay. Look, I was on my way to the library to check out some of these books on my list. I have a tutorial paper to give in a couple of weeks. Oh, what's the topic? Well, I think our lecturer must have trouble thinking up topics. The topic is why study architecture? I don't know. It could give you a chance to set out what you want to do. I guess so. Have you been given any tutorials to do yet? Yes. Mine is called Needs for Sleep. Sounds almost as interesting as mine. This is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. You will hear a lecturer talking about the process of fossilization. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to thirty-three. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to thirty-three. The foremost exhibition in any great natural history museum is almost invariably a skeleton of a large dinosaur, often the famous Tyrannosaurus Rex or T. Rex as it's usually known. Thus, one would think that these skeletons are plentiful, one for each museum, and more to spare in the basement. Well, here's an interesting fact. Almost every one of those T. Rex skeletons are just copies of the original fossils, and we only have twenty sets of these in the whole world. And the most complete is still missing one fifth of its bones, and the rest are missing a lot more. And given that these dinosaurs once numbered in the thousands and existed on this earth for perhaps three million years, you can realize an obvious fact: fossilization is actually an extremely rare occurrence. Fossilization can only occur when, after an animal dies, it is buried in soft mud or silt relatively quickly before the body completely rots or is torn to pieces by scavengers. Given this fact, the overwhelming majority of fossils are in marine sediment, where former marine life sank to the sea bottom, where sediment was being continually deposited. This means that we have a fairly good idea of the life in Earth's ancient oceans, but a much sketchier view of the land-based life forms. Fossilization on land needs water and mud, meaning that it is most often near ancient river sites and lakes. But it is still so rare that there are, in fact, large stretches of geological time about which we don't quite know what was happening at all. Before you hear the rest of the lecture, you have some time to look at questions thirty-four to forty.
Now listen and answer questions 34 to 40. So, given that fossilization is so rare, the natural question is, what can increase its odds? Well, fossilization mostly occurs with organisms which meet three basic criteria. One, they must have hard body parts, for example, shells, plates, bones and teeth. Unfortunately, the soft parts just rot away far too quickly to be fossilized. And I say unfortunately because it is often the soft fleshy features that most interest us. An elephant's trunk, for example, would not fossilize and from the skeleton alone we would never know the trunk was there. The second criterion for more likely fossilization is that the organism in question must have existed in considerable numbers and be spread over a wide geographical range. This simply increases the statistical probability that one of them will one day be fossilized and hopefully found. Finally, and by the same logic, the species needs to have existed on the earth for a long time and the longer the better. So, these are the three main criteria, but there are others. Being a large size, for example, helps us to notice and discover them as fossils more easily. And being a marine organism, as mentioned, helps also. Trilobites, a strange sort of ancient crab, are a perfect example. Their body structure was one of hard plates. They existed over virtually the whole world of their time and over a huge span of geological history, over 250 million years in fact one of the longest ranges of any creature ever. Added to this, some species could grow to relatively large sizes and they lived in the sea. Perfect. These creatures meet all the criteria and as a result, museums all over the world are spilling over with trilobite fossils of all shapes and sizes. As far as fossils go, they are common. So, let's think about T-Rex once again. It too basically meets all the criteria that we mentioned. It has hard parts, being the bones, had some dispersion, and had been around for a long time, although it cannot compare to trilobites in this respect. However, it does have one important advantage over trilobites. It is large, very large, which means we can discover it far more easily than many other fossils. And here's another advantage. Dinosaur hunters are a dedicated and fanatical breed, continually at work in all the likely sites of the world. Basically, us human beings are fascinated by these creatures. So much that we are always searching for them, probably more than any other types of fossil, meaning that more T-Rexes will inevitably spring up in the future, and one is certainly glad for this. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.